Well, hello everyone. This is Rita Van Dynen from CLEAR and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, this is our fifth out of six webinars, so second to last one and I'm amazed at how quickly our time together has gone by. So today's webinar is uh, on digital repositories, existing and existing data curation op uh, options, excuse me. Uh, we do have a guest speaker. We have Nancy McGovern uh, with us from MIT, and I'll be introducing Nancy in just a few minutes. Again, uh, as has been the case with our previous webinars, we'll have a guest speaker. We'll have time for Q&A and discussion. What we don't have this go around is uh, your slide presentations from a group activity. I did forward to Nancy all the questions and comments that were sent in. Um, at the end of today's session, there's just a few housekeeping items that I need to review. And lastly, um, feel free to tweet about today's session uh, with the hashtag, hashtag eResearchNetwork and mention of Clear DLF. We really appreciate those tweets. Okay, as I mentioned, Nancy McGovern is our guest speaker today. Uh, since 2012, Nancy has been responsible for digital curation and preservation at MIT Libraries. She directs the Digital Preservation Management Workshop Series that has been offered almost 50 times since 2003. She, de she developed the Digital Preservation Outreach and Education Curriculum for the U.S. Library of Congress. Nancy has more than 25 years of experience with preserving digital content, including senior positions at ICPSR, Cornell University Library, the Open Society Archives, and the Center for Electronic Records of the U.S. National Archives. In 2015, she was elected Vice President, President-Elect of SAA. Nancy completed her PhD on Digital Preservation at University College London in 2009. So Nancy, it's a pleasure to have you with us today, and when you're ready, the floor is all yours. Great, thanks Rita, and uh, good to see you all kind of listed on the screen here. That's what I, that's what I see of you. Um, so the idea today is I'm gonna, I have, I'm gonna walk through the, um, the models, the life cycle models that you took a look at, not in depth, but just um, in, informed by the questions that you all had, which were great, um, and the perspectives that the different models bring to it, and then. Um, a couple of things that are happening in um, academic libraries for the most part, but also elsewhere, and um, how, do, how are people going about framing their data curation services, um, and then specifically looking at the questions that I got. And, um, and as we go along, um, I, Reed, if you can let me know if there are things showing up in the chat box I need to pay attention to, that'd be great. Absolutely. And otherwise, we'll just get going. Thanks. So some time ago, if, if I, I love getting um, asked to do these kind of things because it gives you such a chance to think about this, where are we right now? At MIT Libraries right now, we are doing a lot of things around research data. We're trying to figure out the roles and responsibilities. Um, my unit, preservation, which includes, I'm a lead for digital preservation. Um, our biggest client, if you will, is archives and special collections. They go out and talk to faculty members. They are talking about, in many cases, their life work, or at least their most recent work, and how are we going to be, what of that will we capture, how are we going to do that? And completely separate from that, we have data management services that are trying to figure out, focusing very much on that, um, that part of it when you know, there's this broader context. So we'll get back to that at the end. But in this, in this context, um, you know, some time ago, a presentation like this would be about, well, you can use this repository or that repository. It's really a point in our community's development where it's about decision points and investment and that wanting to be clear about something that is changing rapidly. The federal plans, the federal agencies that were required to come up with open access plans for journals and data, um, the journal part is way clearer than the data part. So um, some things coming out of that. We're in a real flux period. Um, with digital developments, we're always going to be that one of the questions kind of gets at that, and we'll come around to that at the end. Anyway, so 
What I'm trying to do today is kind of walk through where are we with, you know, MIT is a major research organization and has a long-standing relationship with, the libraries have a long-standing relationship with data management, and we're still trying to figure out, looking ahead, there are a lot of things that we're really having to decide and, and figure out um, right now. Okay, let me see. Oh, here I have to figure it out. There we go, there's the button. All right, this model, so, and what I did is I, I just took them out of the, the article that you read. Um, I added in the dates. One of the things that surprises me about these is it really makes a difference of where did this thing come from. Now, the, the Digital Curation Center started in around 2005, four or five, when it got funded. Um, this model came out around then. This is a published version of it. Um, it encapsulates a lot of the discussions at the time from both the digital curation, digital preservation, data curation perspectives that people are really wrestling with. You can see a lot of the things we have to talk about, but it's, and the DCC is really focused on research data management. Research, um, the research community in higher education in the UK informs what they do. It has broader applications for sure, but that, that is the perspective that we're seeing here. Now, from other perspectives, when I look at it, I use this in digital preservation, and then I go to my models, which I'll come to at the end, um, because just having a preser preserved swoop isn't significant. The best thing from my perspective about this model is that the digital objects are right in the center and that the other things are represented. It's all about perspective, which is why I wanted to walk through the models. This one, wow, this is as kind of potentially overwhelming and, and at first sight um, as the detailed OAS is. Um, so you can see a lot going on here. This is really from a researcher's perspective. It's from somebody trying to both do their research as well as um, publish about it and be sure that it is shared and preserved and things. And it, and it, and it stylizes that, those relationships in a very specific way. Um, a thing that really surprises that surprised me is I'm I'd love to know more than we than you know we have in the article and I'm I'm I have it as a to do for me to find out of what they really mean by appraisal and quality control. It really seems to do with data, but from an archivist perspective, that is a very different thing. One of the things we struggle with in this conversation in the looking at people's models, a model is somebody's representation of the world to help them understand something. So this isn't just pick this model or that model or that model. This is what is this model trying to address? What problem is at the heart of it? And how do they relate to each other? How do we best use them? So it's definitely picking the best of, the, of multiple models or applying a model to a particular situation. This is a great model for understanding kind of how the researchers are going about doing it that combines both the publication piece for that journal piece and the data. So, and it's got a lot of our language in it, like OIS, but it's also um, really not focused on that, and, 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 but it, there's a lot going on. Whoop. Okay. This one was interesting. I included a little bit of the um, description of it because I thought it was so fascinating. It's like, okay, yep, it's six stages. It, said, it refers to it as a high-level summary of the previous model we just looked at. That's, an inter yeah, that's interesting. It's helpful. It actually gets at the fact that a lot of these models are at different levels. So partly, if you really want to do a summary version, this might be really helpful, but it's still coming at it as um, more from the research more researcher kind of perspective. But it does, you know, interesting that it looks at the, it, it looks a lot like the UK um, data archive lifecycle model um, with a couple of exceptions. So um, th there are these that are, you know, like when we talk about lifecycle, a lot of the modelers um, perceive a circle around that, which is, you know, a, a great way of doing it. UK Data Archive. So um, this, uh, the UK Data Archive is the closest sort of collaborator and um, colleague peer institution that ICPSR pretty much has. It's not really clear from the, um, I, I need to go check, I think their life cycle model is older than 2012, but that's the date of the citation. Um, this is really how a data archive looks at it. The data is created, that's great, and it process, analyze, preserve, this is them, but it's also like ICPSR, the UK Data Archive would be called upon to do data curation on behalf of a data gatherer, data producer. 
um, and then making it available. These UK Data Archive and ICPSR and others come out of a very long-standing tradition in the social science world for data sharing. There is no question that you want to share data. We, um, shared data now turns into reusing data, but you know, sharing data was reused all this time for the social sciences. They're trying to extend their, the social science application, so these models should be useful for any kind of content, which is a, a really good objective. The fact that if, if, to some extent, because of the complex metadata required for social science data and the confidential nature of the, the core, the raw data underlying social science work, um, if it can work for social science, it is probably true that it can be applied, simplified, for use in other data contexts. Not for all, but for a lot of it. So it is, it is adaptable to other contexts, similar to the UK Data Archive, and, um, but though in a very linear fashion, like a workflow. What you're looking at here is a, as a workflow in large part. So this is from the Data Documentation Initiative coming out. It basically was born at ICPSR. It's a, um, gone through several iterations. It's a structured way of capturing metadata. And they, um, the fact, um, as they went along, they developed this model for understanding how the metadata model fits with the data. And it turned into this very helpful kind of way of looking at it. You have somebody that says, I'm going to create, I'm going to capture data. This is my study, this definition. I collect the data, I process the data, distribute the data. Data archiving fits in this funny, I used to call it a cul-de-sac when I worked at ICPSR, because it kind of goes off. Um, it should be sort of, I believe that it should be, preservation archives should be really much more an integral part of what's happening in a very active way. But it's often, especially from a data archives perspective, put into this little funnel where we go off and do that. Kind of a, you take care of that for me. And archiving has a very specific IT-based term um, that um, has to do with capture, store, protect, um, to, it's a very different thing than preservation storage. Um, data discovery and data analysis. And this repurposing loop is, is really informed by this real focus on, on reuse. But this is definitely coming from data archives. So not from the library perspective necessarily, though, actively integrating with it, but data curation. This is all about data curation as the UK data archive is. These are all perspectives. So ANS is Australian. Um, uh, National Data Service. Um, they've done a lot of great work. You know, I was so surprised when I first read this article that there's no model. I love diagrams. So I'm looking, where's the model? Um, where's the picture? So when I hear model, I think picture. I think graphic. Um, but the verbs are very powerful. And they're very common if you can see how they really relate to the things that we were talking about. Register is a very interesting one. But discover, um, you know, finding versus using is something that is often quite separate in the data environment. Uh, more so than, you know, finding the data that you need and then using it is a sort of like steps that each can be challenging. And the data one, this is um, one of the NSF data net projects in the US, um, clearly coming after the previous one. And very, very similar, even the number of the, you know, like verbs and how do we do this. Um, but it's getting at the, it's a, it's a cycle of I get the, um, I plan to collect data, I do that, I take action to make sure that it's documented and available. Um, Preserve is now embedded in it. That was, that's a great addition. Um, and uh, we're, there's a lot of good work in all these areas, but you can tell from, you know, if you look at the background, the context for the models, um, they're coming at it from a very particular perspective, and they're also emphasizing certain things and simplifying other things. Here, there's a lot about making things, discover, integrate, analyze. That's a huge um, part of what's, talking, what's being talked about. Preserve as one. Um, it's really an interesting, you know, when you think about it from why are people doing these models and where are they coming from and how do they expect to use them? Why couldn't they use a previous one? Why did they have to do another one? I thought this one was interesting. A number of you in the questions called it out. The capability and maturity model. Our, we've had a maturity model, as you see, as you'll see, for um, digital preservation since 2001. It was published in 2003. It's all about how do we build capacity for this. So I thought it was really 
interesting how they did this. I think it's quite good. You have to really take the noise out of it to see what they're talking about. And again, it doesn't have a diagram particularly. Um, so it's talking about data acquisition. You can see a lot of the verbs we just looked at. The fact that they call out quality assurance and audit. Audit's a huge piece for them. That's really great. Like, what is this thing? How are we doing it? Like, can we show it? So it's, it's the science piece. It's the record of science. Conversations I have with archivists are often about the record of science. You're not, you know, like the archives here at MIT is all over the record of science. But in the broader world of archives, it's often like, what does that research data stuff have to do with me? Well, the other parts beyond the data itself, the, con the research context, are often institute records, documentation that accumulates in an administrative way in an organization. You see data description and representation. What is this thing and how do I work with it? Data curation, pieces like that. And data sharing, so data dissemination. And the repository services and preservation. What they describe there, I, I believe, is more archiving than preservation. Preservation is a much more holistic partnership between the technology pieces and the organizational pieces. But the fact that it's called out, that's a great thing. Then we have this. Um, the kinds of things that need to get done, how do we measure, so the, the act of actually demonstrating you're at a particular level. Um, we have a similar thing um, that I'll, we'll take a quick look at in, from our community for the levels of preservation. But it's not enough to just say, oh, I'm at this level. You have to actually provide the evidence to demonstrate. It's a show me situation, not a trust me situation. So there's a lot of parallels between the preservation community, the archival community, the research, commu research data community. And a lot of this is happening um, as we all develop better understandings of the content and the way it relates. From my perspective, for instance, preservation, it, doesn't, it matters less what is in the digital object than the fact that the digital object is well formed, has sufficient metadata, preservation metadata, not only descriptive metadata, and that's a big hurdle for many organizations to get over. Metadata of all kinds, including preservation. Um, you know, it's much more important that, that ultimately if I can treat a digital object as, um, any, as the same as other objects, that's awesome. Within that, it's much more, after that, it's the, the next most important thing is what file format is it in and what kinds of strategies specific to that content, that format do we need to put, get in, make sure is in place. From the archives perspective is how do these things fit together. They have a lot of provenance um, metadata that they are required to have. And from the um, research data perspective, it's how can we uh, know enough about this data so that it can be used initially, documented, and demonstrated as this is the re result of my project, and then also reused. There are a lot of common threads in here. I like some of the words that they were talking about, like enforce. If you have a policy and you don't know that it's enforced, it's pretty much meaningless. Um, assessment, collaboration, calling out specifically collaboration. What evidence of collaboration do you have? So these are really great models. They do different kinds of things. They could be adapted for different kinds of use. So it's not here's this one or that one. So that's just a quick, just in, in a, you know, if you, whatever amount of time you had um, to look at the models, it's a great base for sort of talking about what are our current data curation things because in the, in, the, in the realm of research data, there are different kinds of stakeholders doing different kinds of things, all sort of geared towards in the future, we want to make sure that we have a sufficient record of the research that we've been conducting. It doesn't mean we'll keep everything, it means that um, we're all trying to figure out what, what should it look like in 10, 50 years from now, but what, what is the record of science and how do we um, construct it now and preserve it to, so that it's available in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so that was a, a recap. This is our maturity model. This comes from the Digital Preservation Management Workshop that Rita mentioned at the beginning. The model itself was developed in 2001, and we've been using it in our workshop and in a number of other contexts. We have, there's an online tutorial. Um, it's used in a lot of graduate programs. It's about making sure that organizations in developing a, a sustainable digital preservation program, of which research data is a component, um, that the organizational leg, the what are, is an organization trying to do, is the, the lead. It comes out as what, is this, what are we trying to do with our digital preservation program. If we are trying to take on board 
some components of research data, how are we going to do that within the context of the broader program? We can't, any, we can't afford to have silos for format-specific things, for domain-specific things. We really need to think about how can we leverage our cumulative infrastructure, how can we collaborate at the infrastructure level. But in building a program, it's what are we trying to do? And what I'm trying to do is different than my neighbors, perhaps. It's not, you know, there's opportunities to collaborate, but it's a, deci a management decision about this is in or not in what we're talking about. Technology is often the thing that people focus on, whether it's research data, preservation, anything we talk about, they tend to really focus on the technology. The technology is important, essential, enabling, but it is not where you start. It's how you achieve what you want to achieve. So when we talk about the technology changing, preservation strategies are responsive to technological changes. Digital preservation programs are responsive to. Our documentation strategies for research should be responsive to changes in technology. As we get new technological capabilities, we're able to produce new kinds of research data, new kinds of content of all kinds. And we also um, are able, we, we have more to do, but we should also be able to use the technology to do whatever we're doing better. So we have what is the organization trying to do with its program, what technology does it need to do it, and then how much will it cost? So in the decision making that we're talking about, it's all about um, the, it's all, it's a sequence of decision making that goes, um, it's ongoing. You get new content, it's unfamiliar, you figure it out. It's familiar, you get on with it. This, um, we're getting to the point where some kinds of research data are, are really familiar to us. Other kinds, not so much. The stages are five stages that for building any kind of a program or basically achieving any kind of outcome in effect, but um, it has to be explicit. So an organization has to say, we are going to you know, preserve digital content. In this case, we might say we're going to include research data within our scope. Take some kind of action to, to make that happen. Consolidate means you don't have project, 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 and the organization gets exhausted doing them, but you use projects within a program. So consolidate is create a basic program and then use projects to achieve those outcomes that you've identified, not willy-nilly. Um, and then institutionalize means you have a mature program. So it's very similar to the maturity model we were looking at before. You have measures for it. There's an article. Um, that from 2003 that like spells out the stages, it's been used in other places, and then externalizes where you collaborate. Up until stage four, you're really talking about coordinating with other organizations, um, other partners, other um, peers of different kinds. Externalizes when you're collaborating. Collaborating is beyond coordination. Collaboration means I'm doing something on behalf of you, you're doing something on behalf of me, and there are implications if we if those things don't happen. It's not just, wouldn't it be great to do something or we'll share information. We're actually achieving common outcomes with shared resources of some kind. All right, so that's, you know, this is, when we're thinking about what are the data curation options for right now, it's within the context of decision making by an organization. The technology exists to do the things we need to do. Organizations have to decide, what can I afford? If you're a hospital, there's no question that you're going to use the best technology to stay online 24-7 to make sure that none of your stuff can ever be, you're going to go to the nth degree because you have, you know, human health records to deal with. In other situations, it's not so easy. You have to figure out, or not so clear. There's not so, it's, it, that's an extreme, like that's a high bar to meet. But in other situations, um, you have to decide, we're only going to go so far this year. We're going to have to plan out our stages. So the maturity model is all about what do I need to do, by when, for whom, on whose behalf. So this is just another model. This is um, the OIS detailed model. Probably most all of you have seen it. Um, it's, a <laughs> it's the version that doesn't get shown a lot, but it is a very specific model about, um, oh, um, you can see, let me see if I have my cutoff here, yes. All right, here we go. Um, there's where like research data is getting created over here, coming into a custodial um, situation. It could be by the researchers themselves, taking control on it, making sure that you have a version that can be preserved. The content lives here. The information about the content lives here. This is how we make it available. 
These are the decisions that we were just talking about. How do we decide what's in scope for us and not? And then this is how we, over time, preservation planning is the future looking, backward looking, I need to take content from the past to the present to make sure it's ready in the future. Now, this is the version that you normally see. But underlying that is a very rich um, model that talks not about what specific technology to use. So it's not going to say, what are we currently supposed to do with, for research data curation? How are we supposed to go about it? But it's going to allow anybody to use to apply their, uh, figure out their use cases in relation to it. It's got the roles, the contents coming from here. Who can we make the data available to? Who's deciding about those things? So we have CE right here. That's its use. Where do we get it from? Um, for data archive in particular, it's, it, it's, the content is very prescribed. You can't take it from everywhere. Um, who's authorized to give it? Who's authorized to use it? And who's authorized to decide what's in scope? An archive has to be what it, you know, able to demonstrate what it purports to be. We are, so ICPSR is the largest social science data archive. Um, it is a partner in research data. That's what they call in research and social science research. Um, we have content that we get from the producer, which is really not ready to go. We do something with it in Jest. We turn it into a package. So data curation produces a package that's bigger than we got. And then this is how we, this is, we're ready to preserve it. We're able to say to the producers, we're ready to do this. This is where we make decisions and we track information about the repository, about the collections within it, the connections between the data, and also where we um, know about the, the objects themselves, individual objects. Um, this is the making it available over time. Making available content right now, way easier than making it available over time. So this is the version of the preservation object that allows you to do dissemination packages over time, over and over and over again. Preservation planning is how you go about doing that, and administration is the cumulative procedural protocols, documentation that you, it's, a, it's the record of decision making about what you're going to do. So I've started calling this decision making for action because people don't like to talk about policy development. This is another uh, life cycle model, if you will. This is, you know, so people feel like, well, the OIS model doesn't really address things to do with pre-ingest, so before we get the stuff. It certainly does. This is an OAS, an extension of the OAS model that talks about, all right, there's content that we know needs to be, right. so the producer says, I have some content, or um, the archive says, you need to give us the content, or the producer says, a researcher or whoever says, I think I need to give you my content. You decide. You agree, a, a deposit agreement. I have the right to give you my data. I don't have the right to give my data. When you have 100 researchers, how do you figure out who's actually entitled to deposit where? Then there's the actual, this is where another workflow comes through of sort of like, okay, we have the actual transfer of the objects. And you can see that it's iterative. So sometimes it might be this research team produces one set of data, that's it forever, and you're done. You document the project. Otherwise, it's really iterative. It's sort of like every, we're going to do it every year. You get into longitudinal data. Uh, perhaps. Web archiving counts as data that accumulates that you want to be able to have access to for researchers. And then this, this is the part where it enters the custodial world and you're trying to figure out, is this the thing that I should, the validation phase is, is this the thing I should have gotten? Um, is, there, is it ready for me to preserve it? Can I say back to the producer, I'm ready to take it? And therefore, this is, this part right down here is it gets deposited in your archival storage and you're ready to say, I'm going to preserve that for you for me, for us, over time. OK. This is, um, these are just the examples of like, from, we have a rich parallel to the research data community figuring out these domains as they're going digital. They're not all done being digital. They're transforming themselves. People are still, there's a, there's a real continuum on, I still have a paper lab notebook, or I actually have a digital form. So we're still in that transition. So we couldn't possibly know what it is that we need to do yet already. This is just another way of looking at a very simple way of, of saying from the digital pres preservation perspective, right, so how do we identify the content, the whole of the content, so all the research data that we might be responsible for, which portion of it do we keep? 
how do we store it for the long term? How do we protect it from everyday and emergency situations? So if it's confidential, we can't make it available for X terms, or we can only make it available to people who sign a user agreement for using the research data. This is all the things we do, manages all the things we do for long-term preservation. And how do we make it available? Because the purpose of doing digital preservation is to make it available long-term. Okay. This is some levels of preservation. So when we think about the capability maturity model we looked at before, this is a way of demonstrating to yourself and to others that you're doing things to protect your data, know your data, monitor your data. Data in this context for National Digital Stewardship Alliance, NDSA, it means your content in any, of any kind in any, you know, any digital form. But it absolutely applies to research data. So how do you knowing these things, and then to do that, there's categories for storage and all these things down here, storage and geographic location, fixity, is it still the same thing that I got? Can I demonstrate that? Can I demonstrate that I'm adhering to requirements for information security? Can, you know, what's up with my metadata, including preservation metadata, and how are my file formats doing? So, much, you know, and to some extent, it's like a bingo card. You don't actually fill it in and you know uniformly across all the roles, but you you actually work your way through, and it gives us a a measure. The capability model that we were looking at before gives you a measure of what you're supposed to be doing. All right, so that is background for what do we talk? You know, when we talk about options for data curation, every organization, MIT libraries is one. Um, there are no, every major academic research library is doing something about data management. They, they pretty much have to. The scope is, depends on the strengths and the activities on campus, has to do with your resources. Small organizations can have quite a big program. It's not kind of tied in that way. So, okay. What data services are, we, are needed? That just cries out for a needs assessment. What do they need? What do they think they need? Is it an opportunity to talk about, well, even if you don't think you need it, we really need to figure out how we're going to store your things for as long as, your data for as long as, as it needs to be stored. Um, what's in scope? Who's asking the question about what's in scope for data services really contributes to what the answer is. So if a, the head of a research center is versus um, you know, someone in the library, someone from the archives versus somebody who is used to, you know, like liaison or selectors who are dealing with researchers out in the community. Um, a big question, under what circumstances would we ever host and preserve data? Sometimes data services could just be the handshake between, right, here's my researcher on campus who produced this data, and, I'm, and maybe a service we're going to do is to help them deposit it, them, the team, whoever's left standing at the end of a project, deposit it in a domain-specific repository, one that is specified by the, by the research grant or project, or one that is determined in, with the help of the people doing the data services. What kind of support maybe is for data management plans? Data management plans really, increasingly, we're realizing that they're not very valuable unless there's follow-up. Just helping someone get the grant isn't as helpful as figuring out what then can I help you with once you get it? What can we kind of do some matching between what did you say you were going to deliver and how can I help you meet those terms? How can I be an active participant? Not every organization wants to do that, but for sure that's part of like what we need to figure out. Then you think about research data and how does it relate to archives and special collections? Libraries right now, are deal, like the librarians, are sort of recognizing much more clearly that unique content that is resident and has been resident for decades, centuries, in archives and special collections is a valuable part of the whole collections landscape at organizations. Some portion of that is research data. If you pluck the data out of its context, you really lose a lot of its value. So how do we document its context and capture the data and document the scholarly record of talking about the importance of the findings? Mm -hmm. um, thinking about what kind of data should be retained. This is a records management um, question. We have records schedules for, uh, you know, for archival in, the, in the archival setting. We need to think about what would a, research, what a, would a record schedule look like for research data. It's not going to be the same for every domain in the same way it's not, a record schedule is not the same for every organization. But we need to think about under what circumstances do we keep the whole, everything that's produced, what versions, 
What does raw mean? Raw data means very different things in different domains. Um, what kind of metadata is required or desired? What do we keep it? And there's not one single answer, which is why it's challenging. And we haven't spent enough effort organizationally or from a research, a community-based research perspective, but we need to. And then, you know, what kind of data can the library itself or the archives or, you know, the people who are doing custodian, custodial work for the data, they also have their own data, bibliometric data. They're, this is like a form of administrative data that is secondary data that can be contributed to researchers. We haven't even explored our own role as research data provider. Okay. So when we think about like data repository options, and if we have to do, this is the kind of thinking that it has to take place. In the past, we might have said, well, we have DSpace, we'll just cram our data in there. DSpace wasn't built to do data. It was really built to do more like the journals. It was built to do library content. It was built to do um, published kind of content. It can do other things. DSpace, like Fedora, can do anything that you make it do, but it's not going to do it just out of the box. Um, Dryad is more of a service, community-based approach. DSpace is you can do that. Is it the best thing? Figshare is another kind of service. Remember, you sign up. Fedora, Sidora is one I mentioned. Um, uh, Thorny Staples has been working on this with great success. It's the Smithsonian Institute version of Fedora that's reaching out um, to researchers. So as they're creating data, they're actually looking at how it would be managed long term. That's digital curation, reaching out to the producers, making it so that there isn't this abrupt and very jarring transition from its state of being created to its state of being managed over time, and then again making it available. Dataverse is a long-standing one now, more than a decade, well more than a decade, that was built from the social science da um, data community, but is reached out beyond. It was born at Harvard. It deals with data curation. Um, it allows for hosted versions of data for, by faculty. Uh, a number of the data net projects have actually um, taken up versions of it. It's getting some take up, but not, not entirely. These are just options to think about. If I have to manage it, how might I go about doing that? And or is, does the data that is being produced on my campus in my organization need to be deposited? One of the things I noted is that in the um, federal agency plans, there wasn't a lot of, the thing that people are most clear about is the journals and what has to happen with the journals that result, journal articles that result from research projects. But um, the single thing that was mentioned most is PubMed Central. Um, how that's going to happen, if it can scale up, why some organizations that are really not about health or not, you know, does it really make any sense? And then there are also a series of domain repositories. Is it possible, though, for libraries and other cultural heritage organizations to be part of developing um, filling the gaps in domain repositories themselves. If something doesn't have a, dom a domain repository, is that something that can be done collaboratively on behalf of and with researchers? So this is a, a way of looking at, oh, well, we have these options. How do we go about doing that? This is making the case. This is from the Digital Preservation Management Workshop. It's a model that's online at the workshop. It's dpworkshop.org, and under Management Tools, you can find references to um, how you go about identifying your content. Um, this is looking at an, um, an, the MIT example to make the case, if you see here, this is what people are used to looking at as research data. They're used to looking at it. You see a lot of, um, of references to discipline-specific tools or data or things. I, ooh, I've been promoting, and it seems to be working so far, looking at it from the Methodist. I'm not the only one to do this, but I think that disciplines, it, we're interdisciplinary, and the disciplines are changing rapidly, and they, it, it, it is entirely, something that we should um, pursue is researchers may have more in common based on the methodology they use than the domain that they're in. People who do surveys have something in common, whatever you know, form that takes. People who develop models of any kind, physical to conceptual to whatever, um, people who get into an analysis, content analysis, the tools, the kind of thinking about it, more similar. Now, not to say that researchers only use one kind of metadata, but when you think about the from the from the data perspective, this would allow us to frame what are the expectations, what am I looking for? If if something was was a data was produced using and um, captured automatically through an instrument, what should I be looking for? 
and what are the challenges? How can we get guidance based on if you produce your data in this way, here's what you should be doing when you put it somewhere. Experiment data. Where's the experiment plan? What are the outcomes? How do we document that? And that's all supporting information for the journal art. When we say capture the data, this is all part of it. So that's how we're looking at it. Um, this is the thing I mentioned about within libraries, within cultural heritage organizations, possible sources for research, various kinds of administrative records um, either about the research or about the organization itself. Um, there's a responsibility for capturing that. Um, geospatial information that we might have that might be secondarily used for research in other contexts, social science data sets. Um, our citations, this, uh, you know, the, the data mining, data analysis, various kinds of applications for that, and web content, so websites of all kind. And over here, research related, archives, special collections, and other, you know, they're responsible for what is the grant. Now, when you see a triangle, it means that it's, we don't have it yet. It means that we're monitoring it, and it might turn into something we take. Circles are things that we either know we're going to get or already have, and the dotted line means it's been digitized and also born digital. So correspondence would be, this would be born digital and digitized. There we go. So that's, that's the model that we're looking for for really what, if we just pull out this middle section, we've lost the connection to this whole other column, column over here. And the archivists and the special collections people are going to be looking at documenting this world, including the data that goes with it. All right. These are your questions. And if you have more, we can also do those. And so hopefully that was a good backdrop for you. I've been kind of watching. I see Rita saying questions and or comments. Um, so are there US institutions of higher education that have achieved a higher level of maturity? Absolutely. There are ones that um, using either the research capability model or the, the um, digital curation and preservation models I was showing you, um, there are Places like Cornell, place, I'm only showing examples. There are a lot of places that have. Stanford, um, uh, Rutgers, have some, um, Rutgers has some activity in, in this way. You can say they have documented, they've made decisions and documented them. They've acted upon them. They have done, you know, they've um, figured out what they're going to do with research data. They have a policy. They have demonstrated practice. They have a track record for it. You had a question, we, MIT scope and analyzing data, are they curating, preserving both institutional and research data? If so, is the same? Okay, so we have an archives and special collections, and um, yeah, um, we, we are, when we get data, we, we're not systematically getting data. This is exactly the challenge, and it's a good question because we're like a lot of organizations as we've been doing like data management plans and answering questions for researchers, but we haven't systematically been getting data. We know that we could not possibly capture all of the metadata, all of the data, research data of all kinds that gets produced at MIT. Um, we are capturing institutional um, data that goes along with research, the records of research. That's the, the remit of the archives and special collections. Again, we can't capture all of it. Two to five percent of content typically has been um, what gets captured from the whole. You also have a situation where you might need to keep, seven years seems to be coming up. People keep saying, keep your data for seven years. I don't know what basis that has. That's, I know it, that's what we have to do with tax records, but I don't know where seven years comes from. Um, but anyway, yes, we are, we, we, we have to some extent tried to encourage researchers, depending on what kind of data, to put it into DSpace. There are some of us who are saying that's probably not necessarily sufficient, uh, or that we're trying to, you know, like let's use it for what it's like, play to its strengths, and use Dataverse more heavily since we're collaborating with Harvard on a bunch of things. Question about high-level imagery was meant to refer specifically to the levels as defined by, yeah, um, but still you were going to see people like um, research. In various domains, they're saying, here's what we're doing with our research data. In complying, you're going to find it. Now, mo many research places, um, what they're talking about is in a research context, right? Um, and most of, most of them, it's kind of like vital records. At some point, they're not going, they don't have the long-term, um, they don't have responsibility for the long-term management of it. That's where the partnership with organizations that do have long-term commitment long-term responsibility for it comes in. Um, at some point, they're going to get on with their, what they're doing. So it isn't just 
the that's one of the things I think that the Baal article does is it raises a lot of questions around in what context and things. But that and that's exactly why I was showing the capability around um, the digital um, curation and preservation is that it's all about managing information over time and various stages of the whole of the life cycle. Okay. Bum, bum. I think a key question for every organization is to understand what a record is. Yes. <laughs> I believe that is the correct. Um, here at MIT, it's really, we don't have a very, um, we often go with, well, we'll take it as a special collection if we can't agree that it's actually in our, um, a record. Um, at least it's kept, but it's not a great thing. Um, uh, we need to mesh some of the strengths we have in records management, archival practice, special collections and manuscripts, research data as a whole. We all have strengths to bring to it, and how can we kind of collaborate to do that? Okay, so there are some ex examples of higher education places that have research programs that have a lot of data, that have effective long-term management, and they're often being achieved through partnerships. Um, in practice, does uh, okay, a variety of um, active research environments. It's not going to be a choose one model. It's going to be use the models as tools, um, depending on what part of the life cycle, what part of the research data problem you're trying to deal with. Um, and that's exactly so. I was trying to, you know, show you the range of models and how um, how they might be used, how what kind of impact they might have. The question about the how does an institution determine how long to keep data? That's there's some principles of, okay, so maybe, you know, you have to understand what the requirements the researchers signed on for. Um, if, they, if it's specified by the program that they funded by, if, it's, if they promise something in their initial thing. Um, there, so there's going to be some overriding kind of principles or requirements that they have to adhere to. Then we get into this domain-specific, discipline-specific um, at that point about, well, what kind of data should we keep? Um, for some places, for some domains, there really isn't an interest or an active use of the long tail, though there's often a historical component of most disciplines. Um, but those decisions, that's the next big hurdle, I believe, that we should be looking at is how do we understand research data from a retention, long-term management perspective so that we can get something like um, a, a research data record schedule framework kind of going. But it's going to be... It is not going to be a single answer. It's going to be, for this kind of situation, this is a model that could work. You want to kind of keep this and toss that. or But it's, it's a collaborative process. The more examples we have, the easier it will be to figure out what to manage. Um, let me see. For those doing data management, critical such as initial management. Um, yeah, I guess any level of um, maturity that you adopt and, demonstr and figuring out if it's matching the criteria for each of the stages. We often just sort of like have hopes that we'll do things well, but we don't actually have metrics for doing it. Let's see what Plato has to say. Hi, Plato. How does an ARL best articulate the significance of standards as practice? Very good question. This is like the elevator speech. Um, like repositories. I think, you know, we don't want to take on an unfunded mandate to try to <laughs> Um, we don't want to um, say, oh, we're going to just, you know, the libraries or the archives, the data archives are not going to want to take on, um, you know, we'll make sure that our institution is compliant. But collaborating on understanding compliance requirements is a way that kind of adds a, a meaning and a motivation to the understanding the importance of doing this. The more that funders are tying future funding to well-managed data, shared data, um, metrics that can say, you didn't do what you said you were going to do, um, the more of a, of a conversation we can have in saying, we have to do this. If we, have to con if we want to continue these research agendas, these research programs as vibrant things that are sustainable, we have to demonstrate good practice. So a lot, if we can tie it to those kind of things, then, then there's the incentives to do it. Many, many of the researchers coming out of graduate programs now are much more aware of the requirements, much more, because they're newish. Um, and they're much more um, um, kind of, the tools are easier for them to, you know, it's, it's not as hard as it was to get, keep, manage data as it was when you had to deal with a computer center. Um, so, and when a lot of the work itself um, was being done partly in a print manual way, as it still is. 
see, given these are great. Given the NAB notebook showing first bloom of spring wildflowers over decades are now suddenly important in light of climate change, I'm still in the forever record retention. I think that's true, but I think you know. I guess I would say that. Um, I, I think that lab notebooks are in the probably you, you, you can always make a good case to keep them. Um, when I was talking about what to retain, I think that you have iterations, people go through iterations of their data um, data sets, um, clean up different kind of things. That's one factor. You also have, this is the, the information that came off the, the instrument. You, you want to be able to go back to that, but you end up, like when you look at the sky survey, that's really heavily processed data that came from an instrument. So which versions, you know, you, what do we want to be able to get back to? We can't possibly keep all of the research data in the universe. Let me see, field, not lab. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it depends on the, on, let's see, field, not lab, but same diff. Um, the, the, um, it depends on the domain um, um, of how things are used. And we worked on the, if you haven't seen the Dipper project um, at Michigan, DIPIR, um, the results from that, it's, they were looking at three different domains and how pra data curation practice works in them, social science, um, archaeology, and zoology. And even to the point of some people's metadata is another person's data. Um, it's, it's, um, archaeology is happening, changing really fast. The technology has made it possible to not even be invasive about finding out about whole civilizations. Huge change in how the research itself is done. Uh, how are we doing, Rita? I'm looking at you typing. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, let me see. I'm going to keep going with a couple more of the questions. And let me know if you're, you want me to stop or pause or talk about something else. <laughs> this is fun. I hope you guys are having fun. I'm having fun. Um, for those doing data management, I'm going to talk about that. As we begin to fully explore RDM services, there's a starting point. People do um, really learn a lot from doing data management plans, even understanding how they can be prepared and, um, and developed. Um, there's also advice, guidance on helping people understand the importance. Um, a lot of places do training on managing your own content so that researchers get a sense of how to do that. You can consider all of these to be under the umbrella of data services. Um, it's, I would caution in the data management plans that we, we stalled for too long in the community on only doing, helping check the box for someone to do a data management plan and then they get the project. But we don't have the, the um, the relationship with the researchers to be to even know some in many cases that they got the grant and to be really thinking pro you know in a collaborative way with them about how might we be, we're information managers and how can we be part of this in a way that we haven't yet been able to achieve. Keep it on the questions. Um, so yeah, so. Um, this was a question based on the, my, um, the DPM work, my preservation and access. It does fit into the, the part, and that's why, in part, why I walked through this question, this framing, was um, in part why I walked through um, the models from the digital preservation and curation perspective. Um, it is in a standalone life cycle. It, 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 has, it has life cycle aspects that fit into this larger world, as you say. Um, the depot curriculum is really in, intended to solve the issue of once you have it. It is not the whole of digital curation and preservation as a life cycle. So you need the different piece, different kinds of models for different things. Um, Pre-existing, I don't know, um, it's, it's very inter interactive. Um, it's not a, you know, just wait at the end of the, you know, the in, end of the slough for the stuff to fall out into a bucket and then we have archiving. It's really more about, I mean, collective without guidance means they're, they have their own sense of, um, documentation, it becomes, if the, in the future, I could imagine archive-ready data where it's ready to be shared into the future. We're not there yet, but we're starting to see more of the motivation for getting there. It's good for the researchers. It's good for the researchers who are future users of similar kinds of data. They want it to be ready. They want it to, they better understand what they, what they want to get, and that helps them to, to provide what other people would need to use their data. But I would say that um, the OIS model, for instance, would came out of the space science 
environment. So it is intended to deal conceptually with the ongoing iterative nature. It's up to you how you apply it. And I guess for this, the one about the question about the changes in technology of outpaced preservation strategies, I would say that that's by default. As technology changes, preservation strategies couldn't and shouldn't drive preservation strategies. They have to be responsive. What we do have to up our game is getting to a preservation strategy as just as quickly as we can once significant, and how do we define it significant is a, a question, significant technological changes. Um, so will there be a point at which preservation and access are baked into it? We're starting to see it certainly from digital creation and preservation. We have systems like Archivematica, open source, built to implement the standards. If we extend those tools as, we're, as we've known we wanted to for, for quite a long time, um, out to the producers so that we can then reach out to the consumers of, of content, that's exactly what we're trying to achieve. This is baked in, I like that term, um, but it's um, the, in the future, data curators, digital archivists, digital preservation people won't have to be you know, su pseudo system developers, software developers to do the things where we have to now. The software is informed by this. We're at about a stage two, trying to get to a stage three in terms of this generation, overall generation of technology and its ability to produce and manage the content that we have. We're really poised. We have version one, at least, of key things like digital forensics. Bit Curator allows us to do a lot of, con you know, a lot of management of authentic record capture and um, in working on the data of all kinds. Once we get it, we have a lot of the pieces in place that even a year or two we did not have it. Um, so that's the goal in the future, and yet what's going to happen is there'll be a hugely disruptive change in technology like we had with the web when it was like all of a sudden we have web. That wasn't, I mean, that was very disruptive. Um, it wasn't, people were sort of predicting it was going to be a flash in the pan. Um, so we'll have that again, and we'll have to go through the same cycle of we acknowledge that this is something we have to do, we have to do a project, we turn it into a program, and it goes on. I think we have one more. Here, uh, we can get the number of life cycle fields that does not need a data curation profile, but that we need a question or something similar for choosing. I think that it um, a one of the data services might actually be raising awareness by looking using things examples of the of the life cycle models to get at the different contexts, the different perspectives. Um, how will we partner to like within our library? We're having to really talk about. What are the roles and responsibilities? Because the archivists are, are tasked with documenting the institute, the MIT's actions, um, uh, core things that document the history, the practice, the administration of MIT, the research and the instruction. That clearly overlaps with the perception of what we need to do with research data. How do we have those conversations and how do we you know, collaborate, how do, we, how do we compromise in some areas that, how do we learn from each other to kind of move forward in some new and evolving ways? Um, in terms of, so the commons, that's, a, it's a, you know, we're seeing a lot of these kind of developments. Where in the circular life cycle does that change need to be in, interjected? I guess this is a longer, uh, the, the dots are all me kind of like pulling things out. I think that, um, I think that they, I see use cases when I read this question, I, you know, I think that um, it, it depends on the situation um, and um, the changes are becoming pervasive. I don't know that that's a good answer, but um, I think we're seeing a lot of change. We have some myths that we've given ourselves, especially in libraries, which are libraries have been do doing data curation forever. We so have not. Now, I'm an archivist, but I have worked around libraries for a long time. We have the perception that we've been doing data curation for a long time because we've had things like data librarians from social science and from other fields that are long-term data sharers. Um, but in fact, in most cases, libraries really didn't know what to do with data librarians until fairly recently. We have the sense that we know exactly what kind of services we should provide. We should not limit ourselves to what we currently know, but allow ourselves to learn from the, the technological change and to figure out what, and have fun finding out, investigating and figuring out 
um, here, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to we're going to step back and collaborate about what would we do if we we're coming to this, you know, like we're landing on the moon and look, there's a research data problem. How do we try to thinking that we're done knowing about what service is limits us to in ways that we just don't want to do that. So there are all kinds of things that we, um, all kinds of things that we have told ourselves that we need to kind of allow ourselves to unlearn so that we can learn new things. Group of sophistication present picking one or two models. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't go through the whole thing that I just would, with you. That's a good point. But I think they could be very useful. Landing on the moon. Yeah, yeah. I like that. What's the use case? How can we get people to talk about it? Well, let's see. Do you have other questions or how are we Nancy? doing? Rita, do you have to tell me to do something? Yes? <laughs> there is one question in the chat window, and you may have touched on it. It's from John at UNLV. Um, uh -huh. He says he likes the DPM model with the MIT example. Have you used it to talk about oh, the I library's role? I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah, okay. no, I'm seeing it up above there. OK. Great. Have you used it to talk about the library's role with DPM and data in general with those within it? Yes, absolutely have. Um, <laughs> it's kind of um, the the three legs of the stool are so valuable to talk about, and it's not about having one of them. It's having all three of them work well together. You figure out what, you figure out how, you figure out how much, for example. Um, it's worked really, really well. And as soon as I, I, um, people are already, not everybody, but the, I guess I would call them the stakeholders within the libraries of digital collections, are really getting used to talking about it in those ways, or at least knowing that I'm going to ask them to think about it in that way. Um, and we're, and I, we're also seeing, starting to see people get, oh, I see. There is really a connection between what the archives is trying to do for institutional documentation and research data being produced in those very same parts of the campus. So there's a, it's a very exciting time. It's, it's always exciting to me, but it's a very exciting time to see some of that organizational change. Because major academic research libraries are able to do shared kind of infrastructure around everybody doesn't have to have all the copies all the time of all the journals because we've been successful in dealing with that there's some there's some interest in looking at well what else could collections mean to us what we have to do is understand that there's there's all these other fields that have been doing this for a long time records management archives special collections um, we've been doing digital preservation for a long time, even before we called it that. So, so understanding that it's joining an ongoing conversation and figuring out how now do we collaboratively, holistically, carefully, intentionally deal with a much better approach to research data than let me go pluck that data out of that record center or that research center. Let's see. What would your advice approach be to talk to faculty say, my domain data is my domain's business and why can I help with that metadata? Yeah, I think that for some, some of these hard nuts. Um, first off, if you're just getting started, start with a champion who really wants to work with you. Don't start with the hardest nut in the bunch. If, um, if there's no, th that kind of my domain data approach, um, there may be no domain repository for that domain, or there may be. So tying it to what are the expectations? Um, how do you get, um, how, you know, in records management, I, I became a records manager by default because if you work with, work with electronic records, you have to be an electronic records manager because the time frames are so close together. But in thinking about that, the records management community wanted to feel like we have a big stick and we can go talk to people and make them do things. We don't. We don't have a big enough stick to make anybody do anything, and it's not any fun at all. So what are the incentives for getting them to say, like, well, you know, what could make life easier? Here are some tools. If we're going to reach out to the producer end, making it so that they don't feel like we're making them do anything, that we're just actually giving them something. Researchers are very pragmatic. They're used to solving problems. So if you slip a tool in and say, here's what you should do, um, or this could help you, then they'll be willing to think about it as long as it doesn't seem like, it's almost like the difference between you know, your friend giving you something and your overbearing parent giving you something. So how do you seem like a collaborator rather than a prescriber? Um, how can you just sort of bring people to the kind of 
like, oh my gosh, look at that would be really help, or you seem to know how to do that. Um, I think that it takes a long time and some people are never going to come around. But if the organization at the highest level supports, no, we have to up our game on research data, we have to be able to demonstrate good practice, that's the best thing that can happen because sometimes what you need is that higher level person saying, you know what, we got to do better than this and we're going to lose our funding. And there's big pushes for, you know, we, we need to have, um, we need to be able to show good practice. And we need to partner with other parts of the organization who are going to help us do that thing. Sure. Let's see. I'm not seeing it. Did I miss any others, Rita? No, I think you've I think you've touched on any uh, everything so far. Um, if you have any other questions or comments for Nancy, feel free to uh, put them in the chat window. Or if you've dialed in, speak up. Um, we have until 2.30. We don't necessarily need to go until 2.30, but we'll pause here for a few moments and um, see if anybody else has anything to uh, add to the conversation. Okay, <laughs> Thank you, Donna. Um, yeah, I was really only supposed to talk about 20, 30 minutes, so sorry about that. But um, I always enjoy talking about it. You know, and as you go along and if you have questions, this is I do digital preservation and curation all day, every day. So. Rita knows how to get a hold of me. Um, and if you ever want to have, uh, if you have questions or want to, you know, float ideas, um, I'm always happy to do that. Well, thank you, Nancy. That's very gracious of you. And again, thank you for being with us today. Um, I know you're very busy. Sure um, thing. We, um, I certainly enjoyed it. Looks like Jason is typing something in the window. He says thank you oh, as well. You're welcome. Thank you, Kendall. Well, while I've got everyone's ear, um, just a reminder that our very last webinar for this cohort is coming up on the 14th of October, and we'll focus on services evaluation, planning, and conducting evaluations of your own. Um, I wanted to just mention that several of you are already underway with your consultation uh, process. If you have questions or concerns about that, feel free to reach out to the um, E-Research Network faculty, um, postdoctoral fellows that are working with you. Uh, the DLF forum's coming up in October, uh, October 26th through 28th, with our in-person meeting on Wednesday from 2 to 5 p.m. We have a guest speaker, Eugene Barsky, who is the Research Data Management Librarian from the University of British Columbia, will be joining us. And you'll be getting details about that uh, meeting shortly. Um, so um, if you have any questions about the forum or the in-person meeting, feel free to, to give me a call or send me an email. Um, and just a reminder in terms of communication, communicating as a group and uh, across cohorts, our Clear Connect group and our Google group. So with that, we'll close early unless there are any other uh, concluding comments or questions for Nancy. All right, looks like Nancy's already left us. So again, thank you all for coming today, and I will be posting a link to uh, the recording from today's webinar in Clear Connect. And enjoy the rest of your afternoon. <laughs>